Well, welcome everyone to Optimization Oslo. Today we're very happy to have uh, Sean Walker from Louisiana State with us, at least virtually, um, hopefully soon in person here in Oslo. Sean is going to talk about uh, controlling defects in the Lena de Gen model of pneumatic liquid crystals. So, Sean, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for inviting me for this to talk. So, this is joint work with Thomas. So let me just dive right into it. I assume you can all, you can hear me just fine, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so, all right, what are liquid crystals? Uh, so it's kind of a, it's a material uh, made up of molecules of a sort of certain structure and kind of the basic aspect that they have is they have an elongated shape uh, which gives them sort of this basic property of being able to polarize light along the axis of the molecule. And that's essentially what gives them their ability uh, to be used in lots of different technologies, such as LC displays, uh, because they can uh, they have this sort of ability to manipulate light using sort of external fields like electric fields, magnetic fields to orient the molecules. So the picture on the right is just a thin film of liquid crystal and there's polarized light that's being shined through it. And so based on how the molecules are oriented, they sort of control how much light gets through. <clears throat> so that's sort of a classic example of what they're used for is optics. Uh, so I'll show some other examples later. Uh, so liquid crystals, Somehow it's called the mesophase of matter, somehow between a liquid and a solid. They have what's called a partial order. So they don't remain rigid in space like a crystal. Uh, however, they're not completely like an isotropic liquid. So the, the partial order is their orientation. So a given molecule will tend to be aligned with its neighbors. And so that's what we mean by partial order. <clears throat> So I just want to list sort of various applications that um, liquid crystal uh, LCs have uh, in a more modern sense. So here we have, you can take what's called colloidal particles. And these are particles that may be made of glass or some other material that you can immerse into a liquid crystal. And essentially what this allows you to do is control the boundary conditions that the liquid crystal has to satisfy at the boundary of the liquid crystal domain. So in other words, how are the molecules aligned on this colloid? And so by sort of tuning how the boundary conditions are sort of patterned on the particles, you can control the state of the liquid crystal field, if you will. So this is one example of that. Similar example, uh, essentially the same people. Again, you have a bunch of colloidal particles immersed into a liquid crystal. And so they make kind of a raft of particles. They arrange themselves just by self-assembly. So just doing energy minimization to uh, attain this, this configuration. And this blue curve that winds through it is a region of defect. So that's a region where there's no order to the liquid crystal. So there's no net alignment. So it is in a sense isotropic there. I'll uh, explain more of the defects a little bit later. This has applications in sort of material science, making uh, photonic crystals, for example. Here's another example. Uh, you have a sort of a fixed uh, kind of membrane that's immersed in a liquid crystal again. Uh, and again, it has you know, boundary conditions that are being, being imposed on the LC field. And then you can modulate this with electric an electric field. And so you can use this to have uh, control how much light gets through these devices. You can uh, look at problems involving self-organization of sort of patches of LC material. And then let me close with a somewhat, I guess, weird application of trying to basically recreate uh, logic gates within a liquid crystal. And so here they created, I, I guess they created a diode effectively. 
So a defect, you can kind of think of that as like an electric charge. And then if you can control how that moves, then you can do things sort of analogous to what you do with electric circuits. And so, I, I mean, this is all simulation. I, I don't think they actually made this, but in principle, they could. And so the sort of application here would be like soft computing to have sort of embedded logic computing in a material without like a traditional computer. Anyway, all of these, a lot of these problems require some kind of control or activation to, in order to manipulate the liquid crystal how you want. So that's why we want to do optimal control of the LC system. So let me describe what defects are exactly. So you have some kind of, basically if you have any kind of fibrous material, then the fibers are kind of like line segments. And these line segments can arrange themselves such that you have sort of a, a region where there's a discontinuity, if you will. And so here's two examples at the top with a line field drawn next to it. And these have different degrees. So the one on the left is kind of like a saddle, uh, almost like a saddle vector field. This is a minus one degree defect. And on the right, it's plus one degrees so sort of splaying out. You can also have half integer order defects uh, because these are line fields. And so on the left is a plus one half degree, on the left minus one half degree. So what do we mean by the degree? So here's just some examples. Uh, so if I took a vector field N and I define it as I do on the left, and then I on the right, I just draw what it looks like. And then I put a just a closed curve that goes around the defect, around the where uh, sort of the center of this. And then I just compute the winding number, essentially. Uh, so I just look at the angle that N makes with a fixed direction, say E1, and then just count you know, how many full rotations it goes through. And so for the top one, this is a plus one half degree defect because it goes through uh, half a rotation as you go around the curve. At the bottom, uh, it rotates the other way. So it goes through minus half a rotation. So that's what gives it the degree of the defect. In this case, here's a plus one degree defect. So it just plays outward, a minus one degree defect. You know, it looks like a saddle. You can, and then you can go to higher order, plus three halves, minus three halves, uh, so on and so forth. So that's in 2D. If we're in 3D, uh, you don't necessarily have point defects, but you have line defects. So along a 3D space curve, each sort of horizontal kind of cross section, or not horizontal, but normal cross section of the curve, uh, will look something like this. So you have a defect that kind of goes along the curve in that sense. So the thing about half integer defects is you can't orient them. So if I go back to the plus or minus one degree defect, even though these are line fields, I could assign a, a direction and give it just make it a vector field. However, if it's a half integer defect, uh, for example, here on the top one, there's no way you could give an orientation to this. Uh, without introducing some kind of uh, fake discontinuity. So that's what's being said here. So in other words, you cannot use a vector field to model half integer defects. And these do occur in applications in the LCs. So you need a model that respects that symmetry. And so that's what the landau Gen model does for you. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of what of where the Q, like how you derive that. So Q is going to be an order parameter. This is a symmetric traceless matrix. And it essentially captures like the statistics of how the molecules are oriented in space at a given point. So Q will be a function of space, but take values in the space as time. And because of these properties of it being a representing probability distribution, there are limits on the eigenvalues of Q. <clears throat> And so here, I'm assuming I'm in 3D, things would change a little bit if you're in higher D or 2D, for example, but will mainly be in 3D. So Q, if you write its eigen decomposition in, in this way, uh, this is called the biaxial form of Q. That's when all the eigenvalues are distinct. Uh, more commonly, for most liquid crystal materials, uh, they actually have a uniaxial 
uh, form. That just means two of the eigenvalues are equal. And so in that case, you can write Q in what's called the uniaxial form, which no is noted at the bottom here. And you'll know there's this N uh, outer product N. And so that is sort of representing the line field. So N is a unit vector field, but if you want the line field for the element in RP2, you have to look at N times N. So whenever I show uh, results of the simulations that I'm visualizing like a line field, I'm visualizing the N. So we compute Q, then I have to do some kind of eigen decomposition to extract N. And so then that's what we actually look at. So anyway, we have this order parameter Q and we're essentially looking for like energy minimizers or doing a gradient flow of an energy. And the energy uh, is given as follows. We have an elastic energy, that's the W term. This could be more general for now. We'll just take what's called the one constant energy or the Dirichlet energy. Uh, but you can certainly consider the uh, more complicated version. We also have the double well, uh, which is, I'll, I'll get into each of these terms uh, separately. There's a surface anchoring term. Uh, there's going to be kind of a Robin boundary condition that shows up. And then there's a right-hand side forcing term. So the double well, uh, this is what controls whether or not the liquid crystal is in a nomadic state or an isotropic state. Isotropic meaning it's just a liquid and there's nothing sort of special about it. The nomadic state is where you have these, you know, these, these uh, line fields showing up. So here, uh, so it's it's not the normal double well that one would see in Alan Kahn, where it's symmetric, so it's a lopsided double well. Uh, here I've given a plot, so I take Q and I just parameterized it as a uniaxial Q and just plot the double well versus S, just to, for visualization purposes, so you can kind of see the double well. Uh, it does turn out that minimizing uh, the double well, its global minimum does have a uniaxial state, and that's part of what its purpose is, is to enforce that. Anyway, but you'll notice when uh, at s equal to zero, that re that's when q is zero. So that re represents an isotropic state, and that's when you have a defect. And so that sort of represents melting of the material. And so there's no net order in that case. Anyway, for our purposes, initially when we were doing this, this work with the optimal control problem, we had to put a somewhat annoying assumption on the psi on the double well that it has a quadratic growth well away from the region of interest, it really should be quartered. Uh, that can be dealt with uh, more directly now, but at the time when we were doing this, we had to make this assumption. The, the controls for this problem are gonna be the, the surface anchoring. And so by surface anchoring, I mean, I'm basically kind of penalizing the boundary condition. So there's no Dirichlet condition, because that's not really how the liquid crystal works. So we're going to essentially penalize the boundary condition uh, that it should have. And so F gamma will be like a surface energy, if you will. So U gamma will be the control that we want to have on the boundary. And then Q is the whatever Q is on the boundary. And we're just penalizing this, this simple energy. So we'll have a boundary control. So it's Eventually, this will be just a Roban type boundary condition that shows up. <clears throat> so U gamma could be just could be any symmetric traceless matrix valued function. Uh, could also have a more particular form. And so the example here is when it's uh, has so-called U homeotropic anchoring. Another control will be for the right hand side. So we have like a bulk control variable, and so this. Uh, represents the effects of like external fields, electric or magnetic. And so this is just an example, but that could be. And so eventually, if you write down the strong form PDE uh, for an energy minimizer, this is what you get. So it's just a semi-linear elliptic PDE, uh, tensor valued. Uh, here, this hat just means take the traceless part if you take this eta gamma, that's the penalty for the surface anchoring. If you take it going to infinity, then you just get there. So boundary conditions. And so ideally we'd like to do control on this, uh, but the solutions are not unique because you have this non-convex double well potential. 
it's not the side prime is not monotone. And so you can't really, it's not clear how to get sensitivity of the controls uh, with, uh, for the how the cue is affected. Uh, moreover, even if you look at a say a local minimizer, we don't really know what whether or not the the energy landscape is really flat there. So we need some kind of coercivity. So instead of this, we control the gradient flow problem. So that avoids all those issues. So to apply a level two gradient flow to the energy, this gives a semi-linear parabolic PDE. Uh, here, the solution is unique. Uh, the price you pay is that now the initial condition is going to affect which minimizer you would pick. So, but it seems to be a, a kind of a reasonable uh, trade off for what we want to do, especially in some experiments because the liquid crystals do go through a relaxation phase uh, in actual experiments. So, here, this PD, you can basically look at this as like a tensor valued version of the Allen Kahn equation, except with a Roban boundary condition. And so having boundary controls as well as distributed bulk controls. Okay. Any, any questions so far? Or... No, no. We're good. We're good. Okay. So so the control objective, so we're going to be controlling not only the a particular state in time, but sort of the full space-time state, if you will. So we have the space-time cylinder and the boundary that's given here, and we want to have like a target state that the Q sensor matches. So we'll call that ZC on the whole space-time cylinder. And then there may be a state on the boundary that we want to control as well as a final state at the final time. Here, I'm just given a plot of what the final liquid crystal state would be. This is the target that we're trying to go for. So you go through and set up the problem mathematically, various several up spaces, the usual kind of stuff, except everything's tensor valued in the symmetric traceless space. The objective functional here, we're doing a tracking type or least squares functional they want to want to minimize. So again, Q is the solution of the L2 gradient flow, and ZC is the target state. There's also other terms sort of similar to this. Rewriting it with norms, we then have this basically tracking type functional that we want to minimize, along with some regularization terms for the controls. So then the problem is, okay, minimize, find the controls and minimize this, this tracking type functional subject to the PD constraint Q. And then another sort of application for this that we would like to investigate that's not about really defects is basically trying to do some kind of data assimilation or parameter estimation. Because the landau Gen model especially when you look at the general one with all the elastic coefficients, it's it's sort of a strange model uh, where it's hard to kind of determine what the coefficients really should be from say directly from an experiment. Uh, for other models, it's actually easier, but for land algebra, it's a bit harder. And so this, uh, the techniques we have here, you could use to sort of determine what should be the elastic coefficients to match a given uh, experimental result. Uh, anyway, so we have to set some space of admissible controls. So we call that UAD, so just L2. And we put uh, constraints on this, basically an inequality constraint on the Frobenius norm that the control has. So two reasons we do, we do this, one is that the controls cannot be arbitrarily big because, again, we have these sort of eigenvalue bounds on what the Q means, and the boundary conditions are supposed to be Q, essentially. So this gives sort of a simple way to kind of control the eigenvalues. doesn't necessarily guarantee the specific bounds we have, but uh, seems to be good enough for what we need. Uh, yeah, right. So that was the, that's the main reason. And then 
given that we've taken this particular form of the inequality constraint, it's very easy to compute the projection to, in order to do like projected gradient descent, which is what we do in the end. <clears throat> so the admissible controls for U gamma is it should be somewhat smooth in time, differentiable in time. Uh, in practice, you really would only have a constant boundary control. Uh, so, and actually for the examples, I'll just have U gamma to be constant in time, but spatially varying. You can do other things as well. Here's an example of what the optimized control looks like. So remember, it's only a boundary control, control so you only see what's happening on the boundary of the domain. Again, the line segments here, that's the, the vector N in the uniaxial form of this U gamma. And the color here is the maximum eigenvalue. <clears throat> so just some references on related work. A lot of people have done optimal control of phase field problems of various types. You know, Colin Hilliard, uh, optimal control of phase field tumor models, uh, vector valued Alan Kahn, uh, Alan Kahn with singular potentials. There's other references as well. Uh, so what we've done, so this is the first optimal control study for lambda allergen with the purpose of controlling the defects or just land out in general, uh, using Roban boundary conditions without a diffusive term, which is what some other people do in these phase field problems. That uh, sort of made things a little bit difficult because we only have L2 controls. So that limits the regularity of solution. So you can't sort of take advantage of certain Sobolev embeddings to make the nonlinear terms nicer. Uh, also some issues with handling a parabolic system. So there's not a scalar value parabolic problem, it's uh, it's vector value or, or tensor value even. So just started going through uh, some of the details of sort of proving the results we have. So you start with sort of setting up the forward problem. So you have the space of weak solutions. Uh, this is just the weak form of the parabolic problem. Basically what you would expect for a uh, semilinear parabolic problem. Let me just show an example of what uh, the forward solution looks like. So in this case, just a 2D problem, 2D example. I'll show 3D later. Let me play that again. So here, the initial state is a point defect at the center of the box. And then this is with the optimized boundary control that makes the defect go to the desired target state. Uh, again, the colors of the maximum eigenvalue of Q and the line segment is basically the maximum the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue, maximum eigenvalue. Okay. Oops. Sorry, I have to move some things around. Close the window. All right. So anyway, so that's the forward problem. And then you have to set up some estimates, such as a Lipschitz estimate, basically showing the problem well posed. You know, if you perturb the controls a little bit, you perturb the state uh, correspondingly. Uh, to prove this, you go through the usual techniques uh, from PDE using a Galerkin approach, take finite dimensional approximations, build up various a priori estimates, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, once you have all these estimates for the finite dimensional problem, uh, you still have to take a limit. So there's still a little bit of work. So you go through that and do that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of that. Uh, it's just kind of technical for the most part. Uh, but eventually you can do it. You can pass to the limit and get the same estimates for the actual solution of the continuous problem. And then the main thing that we needed to get in order to show that we have a problem that we can differentiate. So we have to be able to take a Frechet derivative of the solution of the PDE with respect to the control, because we want to do gradient-based optimization. And so this is the main piece for that. So we need to show, at least for what we're doing here, we want to show that we have continuity on the full space-time cylinder, because then that makes the nonlinear problems nicer. And so we're able to show that with some other additional sort of assumptions on the controls, although since the controls are limited, uh, they're actually in L infinity. So these are sort of trivially satisfied. 
So we can eventually show this estimate <clears throat> that the solution of the LC gradient flow problem is continuous on this full space time cylinder. So any nonlinear terms we have are easily controlled, such as in the, the double well potential. So the way this works is we first note that the Q, uh, since it's an H1, it's actually an L6 on the full space time cylinder. And so this uniquely solves the following bootstrapped PDE. So the nonlinear term is this psi prime. And so that gets put onto the right-hand side. And so since this was modified to have this quadratic growth, the this ends up being essentially an L3, so which is better than L2. And so now you can sort of use additional estimates from PDE theory to sort of make sense of this. So this is still sensor valued. So in order to kind of decouple the problem, so to speak, we take an orthonormal basis. That's these EIs. Uh, if you're in three dimensions, a three by three symmetric traces matrix, this is spanned by five dimensional space. And so now you can rewrite the Q in terms of these scalar Q, QIs, lowercase Q. So that decouples the PDE. So you get five decoupled PDEs basically. And then each of these, you can apply a result that we take from Casas that says that each of these solutions, each of these QI hats are, in, are continuous on the space time cylinder. So then you get it back for the original capital Q bar. <clears throat> Let me just make a note of some other sort of related regularity results, say for Barris Edwards uh, PDEs. Barris Edwards is basically combining the Q tensor model, the gradient flow with uh, Navier Stokes, <clears throat> so having sort of full fluid dynamics. So here's some references there. Uh, However, the main tool that they use is they, they take smoother data and or possibly nicer domains, like smooth domains. And so, which allows them to get like an H2 regular function Q. <coughs> and if it's H2, that means you have immediately by subaloof embedding that is continuous everywhere. We couldn't do that because we don't have that nice of a domain and the boundary controls are only L2, which is all we wanted to have. So that's sort of the main difference here. So we weren't really able to use the same techniques that they had. Okay, so we have sort of basically fully characterized the forward problem. And then to do the, the per se derivative, we have to sort of characterize the control to state operator. So taking a given control and then mapping that to a solution. And we need this to be per se differentiable, which it is. Uh, here's some examples from the actual optimizations of reducing the cost, as well as the residual. <clears throat> so, so the Frechet derivative, you take perturbations of the controls, and then you have to look at a perturbed PDE. So this is like the derivative PDE. And so the main difference is, is you now have this side double prime that shows up. And so now you have to do a little bit more work, show a few more estimates, but you can eventually make sense of this. And in doing so, you can write what's called the reduced derivative or uh, the derivative of the reduced functional, where now we can compute everything directly in terms of the controls and the perturbations, but we have to solve an adjoint problem. But this is standard in doing optimal control. So this is the adjoint equation that R has to satisfy, which is, of course, backward in time. And you'll know that this is similar to the derivative PDE that's written here, the same side double prime. Um, okay, so the final element method. So getting to some of the computations. Uh, this is uh, just a standard, I mean, the space is just H1, so just using Lagrange finite elements. Uh, you could use any degree, but I mean, piecewise linear is also just fine. Uh, we actually do a sort of a fully implicit method. I can describe later, you know, why we do that, but that seems to be the most convenient. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you have to do Newton's method, but it's not a big deal. Uh, we assume the controls are constant in time. So the basic algorithm is, you know, solve the forward PDE, solve the backward adjoint PDE, compute a descent direction, and then do some projection, uh, gradient, projected gradient descent, do backtracking line search, and then just repeat. 
Okay, so here are some of the results. So I'll start with 2D, then I'll show a 3D example. So the optimized control is at the top left. The target state is at the top right. At the bottom left is the initial condition, and the bottom right is the, the final condition. So I so showed this movie earlier. So this is the optimized forward problem, essentially. So we can place the defect where we want. Uh, in this case, we want to prevent two uh, plus one half de degree defect and minus one half degree defect from annihilating. So if the controls were just more standard, the boundary controls were just constant on the boundary, then in that case, these defects, since they have opposite sign, they're like charges, they attract and they would annihilate and you would have no defect anywhere. But if you want to prevent that, you can also do the optimization to figure out what boundary control makes that happen. So that, again, the top left is the optimized boundary control. Top right is the desired state of where the defects are. Bottom left is the initial condition. Bottom right is the final state. So we're able to separate them. So here's a, a movie of that. So they start fairly close, but if it wasn't for the boundary controls affecting it to sort of push them apart, uh, they would annihilate. All right, so let's do a 3D example. All right, so here the domain is just the box. So on the top, I've shown what the optimized boundary control is. It's a little bit hard to visualize since we're in 3D, but so show three of the sides at the top left and the other three in the top right. The desired state is the bottom right. So we want a line defect now, not just a point defect, but a line defect. So each horizontal plane, it has a plus one half degree uh, defect to it. On this slide, so the top left is the initial condition and the top right is the final state that we have. So the bottom right, again, is the, the target. So it, if you look, you'll see that it is pretty close to matching. It's not exact, but it is fairly close. And then the bottom left just shows what's called the biaxiality parameter. So it's just a, the violation of the uniaxiality. Uh, but this only happens near the defect, which is sort of well known. So here's a simulation of that. <clears throat> So again, the, the initial state is just the defect going through the center of the cube. And then the optimized boundary control is able to drive the state towards the desired uh, trajectory that the line defect should have. All right, so I'll make some remarks here and then show some other extensions uh, of this work. So we have a PD constraint optimization framework for Lana uh, well posed in this of the optimal control problem. We're able to show, show that the solution is continuous on the space time cylinder. All the simulations were implemented in GSOLV. Uh, in this case, uh, I mean, I, I use other codes as well. We have FireDrake code, not for the optimization, but for some other liquid crystal stuff. Uh, some extensions of this. So one thing that uh, Thomas and I would like to do is to look at sort of better ways to control uh, the defect state. Uh, one of those is to place the defect without having to specify the whole state, uh, but also being able to control the point-wise state on low dimension sets, which is uh, still you know, not exactly clear to me how we'll do that, but that is sort of a desire. Uh, another work, uh, not on optimal control, but sort of a more general land out gen problem is looking at colosteric shells. So this is where you'll have a sort of a shell with liquid crystal, and then there's an isotropic liquid, say water inside and outside as well. And because of, again, the surface anchoring effect, uh, you can get these sort of interesting optical properties, these reflection patterns that happen. And some applications for this are to produce like a unique identifier so a, basically a unique object that can't be copied. And so it's basically for anti-counterfeiting. 
Uh, also for developing special coatings to put on buildings. And then if you have uh, robots or automated vehicles that have some kind of sensor that can only that can detect uh, that special coding that can take advantage of that for various things. So in this case, the, the elastic energy is a bit more general. It looks like this. So it involves the curl of Q as well as the divergence. The curl of Q is like a row wise curl. And so when you do this, the, the, the twist parameter, this tau knot, when you have this curl, it ends up acting like a symmetrized convective term. And so it, it makes doing the numerics a, a bit more annoying, but you can do it. Uh, here are the results of simulating this model. You get much more interesting patterns. So the color is just looking at the basically the dot products of the director in. Uh, with the outward radial vector uh, from the center of the sphere. Uh, here's some, so if you do a range of twist, basically the higher the twist, the more dense the stripe pattern is. <clears throat> so, and these types of things are witnessed in actual experiments with these colosteric shells. Although for the actual shells, they probably have, they have even more stripes, uh, but having the twist be really high makes it, is more difficult to simulate. Um, so that was a front view, this is a top view. And then to do the control for the more general case, uh, so I had we had to revisit this a bit. So this is with a student of mine, Jeremy Shahan. So if you remember for the symmetric traces matrices, we have a basis. So we can always express, we can always map the tensor Q to a five-dimensional vector. And so if you have the more general elastic energy, say for the colosteric problem, or even just the more general Landau-Gen problem, if you go through and sort of map all of that, you effectively get this parabolic system of PDEs. <clears throat> so M for us would be five, but you know, in general, you could have something like this. And the CI and the DI, these are nonlinear terms associated with the bulk potential. That was the double well, as well as the surface anchoring. So, so if you want to be able to do this, so if we have homeotropic anchoring, there's no D term. If you do have planar degenerate anchoring, then the D term is not zero. But even for this model, you can establish the optimal control problem. You can show the per se differentiability of this. So to do that, if you have, say, reasonable assumptions, uh, for example, if the double well potential is quartic, which it is for the, for the default problem, and say the D term here is zero, then you can do everything we did before, and you don't even need a boundary time derivative to do that. And this doesn't require any kind of continuity on a space-time cylinder. You can actually do it more directly. So that's good. If the D term is quadratic, then you have to have the boundary time derivative because this term is not convex, the D term. So you need some kind of time control there to account for that. If you want to go to a more extreme case and take the double well to be uh, to the sixth power and the surface anchoring term to be quartic, then you can still show everything, but you can't get the Fréché differentiability. This is a pretty extreme example. Most models don't really require this. Uh, if you wanted to be able to have this, you would need to have essentially better PDE estimates, but that would require that the domain be better than Lipschitz. So you'd need like C1 or something in between Lipschitz and C1. So, <clears throat> So basically, for the more general problem, we can still do control, but I haven't, I don't have any simulations of that yet. So that's still to be done. So that's all I have for now. Uh, I can take questions if there are any. Great, thank you, Sean. <clears throat> so uh, my my first question would be uh, uh, concerning this operator A. So that that's a linear operator, right? Yeah, it's this is an elliptic operator, so that's written here. Ah, yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah. But uh, if you wanted to do control of the the more complicated energy that you had a moment ago, um, 
Would you be you able mean, to? You mean this one? Yeah, yeah. Is there is there any uh, major obstacles in sort of copying the, the method that we we already looked at to this? No, because I mean this energy, but this problem you can essentially map it to this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in this case, the controls would be like the GI on the right, as well as the capital FI. But would you want to control that that parameter tau that you showed a uh, a moment ago? I think. Well, the tau. I mean that. I mean, yeah. I mean, yes, you could do that, but that's usually kind of given. Uh, I see. They they can control that. Like they can tune that to be whatever value they want, from zero up to whatever. Mm -hmm. They do that just by doping the LC molecules with some other <clears throat> like chiral molecule that yeah. gives a twist. So they can control that. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I showed some of this to uh, some LC physicists that do the cholesteric stuff. And yeah. they said that you know there definitely are some control problems there where you may want like a special kind of pattern to the stripes. So if you can control that, and again, I think like trying to do uh, trying to use the surface anchoring to do that is probably what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Possibly also electric fields, if you could do that uh, in a more kind of distributed fashion, like that would help. Yeah. But I mean, just adjusting the town knot. I mean, I mean that's just the parameter, right? I don't think. They don't really have the ability to make it spatially dependent. Oh, I see. Okay. That's kind of where my thoughts were going. Yeah. yeah I don't think they could do that. But and they could certainly pattern the device to have boundary conditions that vary in space. Yeah. They could so do that. So you can actually produce one of these uh, objects in the lab, like one of these, uh, because these are very small, right? I'm guessing maybe on the scale of microns or, or smaller. Is yeah, it, right. it's possible to do the control on that to this detail on that level. Well, well, in addition to the shells here, they also do slabs. So you basically have like a two parallel plates with mm -hmm. the liquid crystal in between. So you can control the surface anchoring on the plates. I see. Uh, without you know too much difficulty. For the shell, you would probably effectively. I don't know if they really could do the surface anchoring. It would probably have to be the external field that they control. But the people that I showed this to, I think they had the slab geometry kind of in mind for doing the optimization. Yeah. So, so you were able to convince uh, people who actually build these things that this is a useful technique? I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Great. Let me just uh, pause also, the just the just the parameter estimation stuff would be useful because what they do now is a little bit more ad hoc to figure out what the constants are. So you mean uh, in inside the the bulk energy from, from well the inside the elastic energy. So if you look at the more general Landau Dijon, it's got I mean really up to like five constants right for different terms. And if you do, there's another model called the Osteen Frank model. Yes. And that also has five constants. Wow. But in that case, they can actually, so physicists can set up a specific experiment that will isolate one constant. And so they already know how to estimate those very well. But they don't know how to do it for Landau Dijen. So the way they get the constants for Landau Dijen is they do this mapping procedure from Osin Frank to Landau Dijen that's not perfect. It's not perfect, but like, is it fairly accurate to the point where they'd be happy enough with it, or is there actually potential? Uh, uh, not necessarily. At least the meeting I went to, there was some. That's why I put that slide in actually about yeah. the parameter estimation because I was giving a talk there, and but someone was talking about how it would be much better to just use like experimental data. Because they even have they have time series data. They take videos of like how defects move and annihilate. Yeah. And I mean, you could use that to figure out what the parameters are. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Instead of doing this ad hoc mapping procedure, which is okay. I mean, it's better than nothing, but right. it's not perfect. Right. 
And did, uh, did you talk at all about the, this sort of placement of the defects, this uh, sort of n minus two dimensional or n minus one dimensional constraint uh, that you briefly mentioned earlier that you and I had spoken about a few months ago? The idea I, like, I didn't really mention that. Uh, it's still a little unclear to me what, what to do there, actually. Right. Me too. And we have a lot of people here who work on these 3D, 1D models um, and have more experience with, with that. Maybe it would be a good idea to talk to some of them um, because it's, it's very strange, right? You, you, you know, you don't really have a trace uh, if you go down two dimensions. Yeah, right. Uh, so, and, and if otherwise, it's like looking at some kind of weird perforated domain, um, which uh, yeah, has its own challenges in a sense. Be worth looking at. Now, I did see some recent work that, that they did here on uh, taking sort of a 3D, 3D model and then letting one of those 3D structures uh, go asymptotically to zero and they have some error estimates about how far away it is. So you can kind of like maybe go the opposite direction where you would like blow things up a little bit. Uh, and maybe you could say something about that. Let me pause.